talking with you today, Liza. I'm in love with you. <laughs> Let's get married. Let's go. On today's show, Laura Haywood interviews Broadway actress and host of the immensely popular podcast, Little Known Facts. My friend, Ilana Levine, is here. Welcome to Laura Haywood Interviews. I'm Laura Haywood. And before I welcome Ilana into the room, I want to thank you sincerely for being a part of this show. I wanted to do a broadcast like this for a long time. My background before Broadway was as a radio host, and I've missed it so much. So this is actually the 20th episode of Laura Haywood Interviews, so it's a little milestone to celebrate today, and I'm just so full of gratitude. Um, I want to make sure you know that there are actually two ways to listen. There's the free on-demand podcast that comes out twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays, on Apple Podcasts. And that's how most people listen, and that is my gift to you. It was important to me that there be a no-strings-attached free way to share the show with you. There's also a way for you to help me continue to make the show, um, help me cover the costs that it takes to make it possible, and that's by going to dnrstudios.com slash Laura. That's the letters dnrstudios.com slash Laura. If you pledge a few bucks a month um, by hitting the subscribe button on that page, you'll actually get every episode a full week early, and you can even listen live and call in when the show is happening if you want. So whether you decide to do that because you can't wait to get each new episode early or because you want to help me keep being able to make Make this for people who can't afford to throw a few bucks down every week, um, or hopefully both. I'm just really grateful to those of you who have responded to the show with contributions that help me keep making it. I want to say that one of my biggest inspirations in moving forward with Laura Haywood interviews was my guest today. Alana Levine is such a light in my life and just burst into my heart so hard and so fast what we, that when we met that within moments we were saying we should get married. And we have literally referred to each other as wifey ever since that first day. It was only about two years ago, but it feels like we've known each other forever. Um, not just because she guest starred on basically the most memorable episode of television I watched when I was a teenager, um, but also just because her heart and mine seem to reflect each other back to each other. Um, you also might remember Alana as the yoga teacher who foiled the contest on Seinfeld, if you don't Google it. Um, she also made a big splash on the Broadway stage as Lucy Van Pelt in the 1999 revival of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and has also appeared on Broadway in Jake's Women, Wrong Mountain, and The Last Night of Ballyhoo. Here are some little known facts about Alana Levine. She was discovered and sent to her first acting class by a hot hairstylist in New Jersey named Bruno. The first agent to sign her was also her boyfriend in fifth grade. She took piano lessons from Tom Kitt, who would go on to win a Pulitzer Prize for composing Next to Normal. She's also a founding member of the Naked Angels Theater Company, along with notable names like Joe Mantello, Marissa Tomei, Mary Stuart Masterson, Fisher Stevens. Maybe you've heard of some of these people. On her podcast, Little Known Facts, she's interviewed nearly 150 superstars, from Patti Lapone to Octavia Spencer to John Slattery to Ben Platt, who calls Alana his favorite person in the entire world. Little Known Facts has grown from being a weekly in-studio conversation to a full-blown entertainment brand, including a series of onstage interviews at the Atlantic Theater Company with names as legendary as Ted Danson and Mary Steenburgen, Ben Stiller, the creative team behind the new musical The Secret Life of Bees, and an entire series at Broadway. Broadway Con. Alana and her husband Dominic Famusa are the dedicated parents of two beautiful kids and Alana is as committed to and generous with her family as she is with her work. She's seemingly been surrounded by angels her whole life, naked and otherwise, and she has certainly been an angel in my life so this is a full circle moment for me. Being a guest on Little Known Facts with Alana Levine was one of the first times I remember a journalist wanting to know more about more about me than about my brand, Broadway Girl NYC. And she really cared about what made me whole, who my authentic soul was, and what the real Laura Haywood was all about. So I am delighted and so proud to return the favor, turn the microphone around, and dig deeper than ever into the whole, real, authentic Alana Levine. Welcome, my friend. I am going to cry. That Good, do it. <laughs> cry. <laughs> You're the safe here. The combination of my allergy meds <laughs> and that intro, um, I'm, I'm moved and honored and humbled to be here. That is all I can say. And as I watch you behind the mic on the other side of uh, the studio, I'm just so proud of you. That's I, I have felt this incredible parental love for you. Mm -hmm. And... and um, 
you know, we call each other wifey because from the minute we met, that was a fantasy that yeah. we both um, felt like could work for us <laughs> if we were on, on an alternative path of some kind. Sure. But really, like, I'm just so proud of you, and I can't believe how good you are at this. Of course, just one more thing you can do. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we could definitely and probably will make this a mutual love fest for yes. the next 50 minutes or Sorry, so. Sorry, guys. Um, but I, I also, and, and like, I don't want to discourage that because I think, <laughs> you know, it, it would be very easy for people to see what we do as as being in competition a little bit because we talk to similar people. We have similar sort of uncensored, uh, unrestrained platforms that are more about digging into, you call it little known facts. I don't put a, I don't have a name for it, but like I, I did, I do have a, a segment that I used to call, um, I used to have, like, have it be an official thing called Yes And, where I wanted to be like, yeah, you're known for, you know, being in Hamilton, but also you do all this incredible mm -hmm. volunteer work. Or, like, yes, and yes, you, you do, like, yes, I'm Broadway Girl NYC, but also right. I was a sportscaster for a long time. You know, the things that get lost in branding. You and I have talked about this before. I am a strong believer. I always have been. Part of it is growing up with two sisters and 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 the kind of family I grew up in. And I told you this when you so sweetly came to me and said, I'm thinking of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I firmly believe there's room at the table for everybody. There's only one Laura Haywood. There's only one Alana Levine. And our mission is to share stories of people that inspire us, that we hope will inspire other people. And how you do it and how I do it is going to be in some ways similar and in many ways different just because we are all individually different yeah. people. But my whole coming up from starting a theater company, as you mentioned earlier, has been about community and making sure there is a place for every voice to be heard. And that doesn't mean I don't get jealous sometimes or have competitive feelings like everyone else on the planet. That is my Achilles heel. I work on it all the time. But deep down inside, I really believe that generosity, openness, helping each other is the only way for the planet to move forward in a positive way. And all I feel is proud. That's all I feel when I think about Laura Haywood interviews. Oh, End of story. Thank you. You're you, welcome. You're one of the real reasons that I decided to call the show Laura Haywood interviews. You are the only person I talked to before starting the show who didn't say, you got to name it the Broadway Girl Show because that's what the brand is. Oh, interesting. Um, you were like, do the version of it that gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. The version that feels the truest to you. And you you understood, I think, because your show is, is motivated by the same kind of thing, you really encouraged me to prioritize authenticity over, like, potential advertising dollars. Right, but also, you know, as much as you and I love Broadway mm -hmm. more than life itself, yeah, exactly. um, I think we're interested in all kinds of people, all kinds of artists, and then all kinds of people doing all sorts of things. And so it's important that your show be a platform for anything you care about totally. at any time. And so the name Broadway Girl, obviously, what we're discovering is there are many layers to Laura Haywood, and Broadway is just one of your passions. Yeah. Plus, I just yeah. turned 40, so how long can I hang on to girl, you know? When <laughs> Broadway I, lady <laughs> NYC. I know. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the alternative would be. Um, but uh, Broadway madam. <laughs> oh, gosh. We could go sounds, anywhere. That sounds like a like a side business that I don't know that I want to. Well, you know, it's hard to make money in radio, <laughs> well, so whatever it takes. casting couch to a whole new level. Exactly. Um, okay, Lana, let's mm. go back back to uh, there like as I mentioned in the intro there's this pivotal moment when you went to get your hair cut and your hair hairdresser Bruno had a script on his his station, station yeah. and you picked it up and started to read uh I want to go back before that oh okay what did you want to be when you were a little girl if you didn't discover acting until you were old enough to go to the salon what so, did you want to be when you were a little girl I was obsessed with cars I was obsessed with cars. I had lots of little, you know, miniature cars that I loved to play with, toy cars. And anytime we were on a road trip, I would look at every car. I would know every name, make, and model. I was obsessed with them. And my father had a friend who made auto parts. So I would like obsessively talk to him, like, AC Delco, tell me about that. Like, I was literally like this. <laughs> 
weird. I've never really talked about this. But that is what I thought. I would do something with cars. I, for a long time, secretly wanted to be a car saleswoman. Uh But as you know, that is a profession that has such a bad rap. Uh Um, Everyone thinks like they're shysters and they're trying to like cheat you. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to turn this all around. I'm going to be the first person who like sells you a car honestly. I'm going to holistically look at you and your life and figure out which car for you and your family would be best. So for a very long time, and I'm talking like through high school, I secretly, although I would never tell anyone this because everyone had these huge aspirations to go into politics or or theater, all sorts of things. And I was like, I'm going to sell cars, but I'm going to be the first honest car saleswoman on the planet. So I bet that, if anybody could do it, you could. That is what I is thought. Is it too late? Like I don't think so. Holistic car sales. Yeah. With a lot of yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Holistic Car Sales. You can um, make it an offshoot podcast. I don't know what it, but for some reason, I just had this whole like weird obsession with cars. I still love cars to this day. Um, do, I love do, NASCAR. Do you live in New York? Do you drive? I do. What kind of car do you have? I have a Lexus SUV. Um, that sounds pretty a, good. Uh, it's not a recent model, but it is um, it is really nice. Um, you can find all sorts of things like goldfish, Cheez-Its, anything <laughs> you want under the seat. I have two kids, so if you're hungry, just look under the seat <laughs> of my car. We Story can feed you. Story of every you. mother's life. Exactly. Every exactly. parent's life, I should say. Yes. We also live in New York City, and it literally, like every day, there's just one more ding on the car. And now I just see them as badges of honor. Mm-hmm. Like, it's fine. Like scars on our bodies. That's we right. earned them. You That's know? right. They're the stories of Street our parking. adventures. So, but I literally, like, if we had a contest right now to Parallel Park, I would win. I'm sure. Like, I'm just really good at driving. Anyway, this is like a uh, no, I kind of boring. This but because, like, look, I've I've watched and listened to a lot of interviews you've given, and mm-hmm. there are stories that people can find. I want to get into the ones that like you haven't told. That's before. the one. And so. When did you I, think you might be a mechanic? Like, did you ever learn how to, like, how how far into cars can you get? Do you can you do you change your own oil? Do I you could change, change your own oil. Tires? I I mean, I can do the from the from the lease like win, windshield wiper fluid, uh-huh. like pretty straightforward. I could change a tire. Um, I could probably, if I really, you know, opened up the book and looked at it. I never was like tinkering under the hood. I don't want to. Um... No, like rebuilding the carburetor. <laughs> no, no. Because the idea I didn't of have a car a up monkey, on blocks. I freaking love. No, but I love the jumpsuit. Yeah. Like for me, there's also a fashion that goes to sort of the whole world of. Anyway, I love all of it. I don't know what that was. It just was. Um, and then I did do you know I graduated from high school when I was only 16 and my parents really wanted me to do a gap year Mm -hmm. before I went to college just to mature a little bit how did that happen by the way were you just insanely smart did you start really young I started really young Uh um I I, I'm not insanely smart but I did start really young and uh I had a lot of relatives in Israel and so it just came to be that I would go to Israel for this gap year and I lived on a kibbutz. I met, like, of course, all the guys I dated were, like, Swedish, not one Jewish guy. Like, I think my parents were like, she'll meet a nice Jewish boy. Nope. All the Swedes who worked were on kibbutz, and- they would come and volunteer. It was awesome. They were so beautiful and so <laughs> nice. Um, so then I came back, and I really wanted to move back to Israel with my Swedish boyfriend. And my parents were like, if you were going to go to a small country like that, absolutely, if that's what you want to do, but bring, get a degree, mm-hmm. go back to that country with something to offer, help them move forward. You were like, guys, I'm going to sell cars. <laughs> I mean, hello, <laughs> tractors on the kibbutz. So I came back, there was a lot of like friction with my parents because here I was like, you sent me there. You were mm-hmm. the guys who like sent me to Israel and now you're not letting me go back. So... In that back and forth, I um, took a semester off, sort of as we negotiated what my next step would be. And that was the time where I sort of came back with like, I don't know, a haircut that my parents were not pleased with. And we were going to a family wedding. And I went to get a haircut from Bruno Rondinelli <laughs> in Teaneck, New Jersey. I'm and Bruno him. had... I'm going to find out what he's doing now. He, he has his own salon. He really, at the time, like looked like Warren Beatty. It was just 
All of it was fantastic. And I've said this before, like almost everything in my life that I've pursued started out because I, I was in love. Like I, I was in love with Bruno Rondinelli <laughs> that day. And I would have gone anywhere. How old were you at this point? Uh, 17. So I don't remember what the play was, but I'd never seen a Samuel French edition of a play before. We had yeah, like collection. The edition. Yeah, so he had an acting edition. I started reading it out loud, probably to just flirt with him. He was like, You're a really good cold reader. Did not know what a cold reader meant. He's like, Hey, tonight I'm going to my monthly acting class at the Terry Schreiber Studios in New York City, and it's Wednesday night, and it's like free audit night. Wow. And I went, and. There were all these people doing sense memory exercises where the teacher would kind of, it's like a guided meditation. Like the teacher was leading like in, them. Like in um, a chorus line when they're yes. like, you're a, uh, we don't have bobsleds in San Juan. But this was like, everyone was doing these stories from their past that were so dramatic, like really um, compelling beautiful, vulnerable. One woman did a thing where her thing was, even as an adult, she, at the end of her workday, would come home, open her fridge, and from behind all of her groceries, take out a baby bottle and drink from a baby bottle at night, like really revealing either unbelievable traumatic things from their childhood or secrets about themselves from now. Like, just imagine someone having the courage to share with a class, some strangers, auditors, mm -hmm. I come home from a long day at work, and rather than open a beer, I drink out of a baby bottle. Wow. My mind, now, by the way, I've never been in an acting class. I don't know what's happening, but I remember feeling, like, honored to be in a room with people who trusted me with their deepest, darkest truths, and a teacher who was guiding them through these exercises with so much love and respect. And I didn't know that that was the beginning of a big life change. Bruno went back. Bruno never came back to that class. I ended up, I never left. And Have it really. Have you told him like what a big difference he's, he made yes, in the course of your yes, life? Yes, yes. Because especially at the beginning when I was doing a lot of Broadway and a lot of interviews, it was that was the narrative. That's like the because of, story. Absolutely. Because of Bruno Rondinelli and that thing in life where you, by chance, are sitting in a salon with some beautiful guy who's being so, you know, Bruno was probably 10 years older than me, but he treated me with like an adult. Mm -hmm. Like at 17, you're like, are you a kid? Are you an adult? Um, I, by the way, I was madly crushing on him. I, I don't think Bruno thought of me that way at all. You know, he was not being inappropriate in any way, but he saw this curiosity in me. Anyway, that teacher's name was Gloria Maddox. It was, as I said, part of the Terry Schreiber Studios that still exists today in New York, an extraordinary uh, acting school. She became a, a, a mother figure, a mentor, and really one of the most important people at the beginning of my artistic adventure because, as I said, I had no idea it would become a career mm -hmm. it it focused me on like okay if I'm staying in America to go to college I'm gonna go to an acting program I ended up at Fordham um, yeah and didn't you have just like what ended up being an all-star class were what, your classmates there so in like everyone's my, become successful everyone a lot of people have and and it's funny I mean some people were so I came in as a freshman, and maybe they were seniors, like John Benjamin Hickey. Mm -hmm. Julie White had gone to the school and then came back as a returning artist. Um, Patricia Clarkson went there. Denzel Washington went there in my class. So no one we've ever heard of. No one you've heard of. <laughs> Matt McGrath, who's an extraordinary actor, uh, came in a year after me. So it was just this... Uh, crazy collection of brilliant teachers and brilliant students and then people who acted at the time went on you know this guy John Melfi who went on to produce Sex in the City like people splintered off to do other things in the entertainment business um, all of whom have become super successful and I just found um, I found my people you know I didn't know I didn't I didn't know I was lost you know and there I was found in this world of um, just generous, interesting people running around New York City seeing theater. 
that right. was the thing. Just seeing everything all the time. You know, SRO or ushering. We all ushered at the Minetta Lane Theater because um, Steppenwolf was coming in and they were doing Bomb and Gilead. So I'm watching Laurie Metcalf and John Malkovich and Gary Sinise and, and Glenn Headley and all these mind-blowing performers um, and then I'm seeing people my age in plays. So that was the first um, six degrees of separation was mm-hmm. happening. And so suddenly there are people. Maybe, Do you mean the, the play six degrees of separation? Yes. As opposed to the like, oh, I know somebody. No, who knows not somebody. the Kevin Bacon thing. Yeah. So, so, you know, Stalker Channing in that play was extraordinary. And then all these actors who were a few years older than me, but in in the realm of my reality, like Evan Handler and, um, I don't know, just just seeing people your own age on Broadway. It is like that other six degrees of separation where you're like, we, we have friends in common. Like, yeah. these are not an alien race of superior talents. No, they're talents. just beautiful actors who audition and got these parts. And, and who worked hard for it in the same way that I have the yeah. capacity to work hard for it. Huh. It was really extraordinary. And then... Yeah, and then I got out of school and had this crazy thing happen where I was going through backstage. I auditioned for a David Mamet play and called Edmund. I got it. I'm backstage. I hear someone's voice in the hallway saying, has anyone seen Alana Levine? And this guy walks in who was at the play who had been my boyfriend, I think actually like third grade oh at gosh. sleepaway camp. And his name was Stephen Hirsch, and he had become a talent agent. And... Literally, he sounded exactly the same <laughs> as he did when he... Like, uh, yeah. Your voice didn't Steven, change. Exactly, but your career has. And that was really helpful, too. It is so crazy and funny and weird how the world works. Like, I, you know, I remember... It doesn't have the same kind of outcome, but, like, I remember... I went on a blind date with a guy when I was on my study abroad year in the 90s in London. Yeah. Um, with some American guy. And then, like... 15 years later he I saw him on stage on Broadway and I like sent him a note and now we're friends again and you know like I thought of you the other night are you the one who knew Adam Duritz so I know Adam a little bit um we have a long we have a long history okay. but but I don't know him well okay um, we went to the same high school okay he went to high school with he went to high school 15 he graduated 15 years before I did okay but then in Berkeley it, yeah in Oakland California okay. um and then it was private school, so I think he lived in Berkeley. Um, I, in that same year, 1999, when I was studying abroad in London, I, uh, Counting Crows was doing this tiny show at like a 500 seat venue, but because they weren't as big in the UK, we were able to get tickets. And then I went up to him and I was like, yeah, I'm from Oakland. And, and he was like, what are you doing right now? And I ended up, my friend and I ended up hanging out with him and one of the other bandmates for like uh, overnight. I missed the last train. I had to take the first train back. I was staying way out in the suburbs with a family. And anyway, I had to take the day off school to sleep, sleep it off, but still. And then we have, our paths have crossed over and over and over again over the years and weirdly enough um, regular listeners will to Laura Haywood interviews will know that I have this online alter ego called Broadway Girl NYC that was anonymous for six years nobody knew it was me and randomly Adam Duritz from Counting Crows was one of the first people to follow me on Twitter not knowing it was me and then once I and then I was working at Sirius XM and he'd come in to perform uh-huh. with the band and stuff. And at one point I just confessed to him that I was Broadway girl. And from that moment, it went from more than just sort of this occasional we have things in common thing right. to like we're both there's remotely. something there. And we've actually talked about having him on the show. I don't know when that's going to happen because we were both so busy yeah. and he's traveling and touring. I but. was at the theater the other night and and my husband knows him a little bit. And and as I was talking to him I was like anyway I was like who is it who is it that I know this and it was like right at the like right outside my brain's memory Uh and then as I was sitting here I was like it's Laura (laughs) Laura was who knew Adam it would have been so helpful to be able to go we know Laura in common anyway love him that the Counting Crows were such a soundtrack to my early years in the city and sort of pursuing this and remained just like one of my favorite that first album is like definitely one of my uh, desert island discs. Totally. Um, but they've man. Anyway, we could do a whole fan episode we about will. Right Counting on. Crows. I'm gonna send them this and be like, 
now will you this come This is for on? you, Adam. Um, Adam, we but, met at Moliere in the park. <laughs> it was great. The point being, though, that that the relationships we make, we just never know how they're going to turn out. And I have very complicated feelings and sort of conflicted intellectual versus spiritual debates going on in my head all the time about fate and what's meant to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, uh, I don't know, just all that, all that kind of stuff. But I feel like we, when I'm around you and there are certain other people that I, I feel like, how can you not believe in something when even if it's just how incredible coincidence is and you know you can do the statistics and look at the science or whatever right. but like one tiny little thing like what if you what if you'd gone to a different salon yeah. or what yeah. if they were they'd been a different exercise in that class that day right. or what if you hadn't started school so early so yeah. you were a year behind yeah. so you didn't All come of back it. like it's actually Sammy Cannold, who's a young director. Do you know Sammy? Um, she was here uh, last week, and there was. I asked her about a very pivotal moment in her life that could just as easily have not happened, and she was like, I kind of don't want to tell the story because it feels so... Um, I can't remember the word she used, but it was like... It still feels so tenuous. Like if I talk about it, maybe right. it won't, maybe it won't have happened. Right. <laughs> Even though it's clearly happened. I know. It's just it it almost feels delicate. Well, it's so crazy. You know, when you speaking of like bands and 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 suddenly like these people you worship becoming people you know. Mm -hmm. So when I was in high school, right after high school, that summer when I came back from Israel, all around this Bruno Rondinelli time. A friend of my sister's, my sisters are seven and eight years older than me, a friend of theirs stopped by randomly to say hi to my mom. My mom was the kind of parent that like everyone would always hang out at our house when we were growing up. Like everyone loved Helen. She was the mom everyone wished that they had. And I assumed he was coming back to see if my sisters were home. And he's like, is your mother home? She wasn't. And he and I ended up spending all of this time talking together and catching up. Um, and he had just gotten back from Europe where he had somehow through like a strange course of events, sort of midnight express, to be perfectly honest, his friend and he had been in Morocco. He made it out. His friend didn't. And he's at a bar in London trying to figure out, like, how am I going to get help for my friend wow. who very stupidly put something in the bottom of his shoe that he should not have? He put hash, like, in the heel of his oh, shoe. No. And the two of them, they had made a very clear pack, like, we're not doing that. But at the last minute, the friend did. And this guy ended up sitting next to a guy named Chooch McGee, who was one of the recording engineers for the Rolling Stones, who happened to be in London at that time recording. And this guy ended up going, like, I know someone who can help you. And then this friend of mine is telling me this story. He finds himself, like, ten minutes later at Keith Richards' house. Oh, my gosh. So he becomes best friends, mostly with Ron Wood and Keith Richards. They are close friends outside of, like, when they're not working, mm -hmm. Ronnie Wood and Keith are really good pals. The band loves each other, but they really spent a lot of time with each other. I end up falling in love with this guy I end up spending like three years going to college by day hanging out with the Rolling Stones at night right what? like having these two crazy lives like I would do a little play in the black box theater at my school like like I ought to be in pictures by Neil Simon and like Ronnie Wood and his wife came like there was so much craziness going on in my life and I remember having this moment where Ronnie Wood's daughter, who probably is 25 years old right now, Ronnie said to her, Leah, Alana's an actress, and we're all hanging out at his house, and, and Leah, in her little British accent at like three, was like, oh, sure she is. And I remember thinking like, oh, she doesn't believe me. This little girl <laughs> doesn't believe me. What do you think that was about? I don't even know. Or it was rhetorical. She was three, well, what by I, the what way. What it makes me think of is, like, who else were they bringing around who was claiming to be actresses? 
And or also, trying to be. or And also, by the way, or were, like the most famous actresses of their day. But I remember, it's so crazy, but this little part of me was like, I'll, sh- I'll show her. So you I'm were hanging around be... with the Rolling Stones when you were in college. Yes. And how, like... When you, you said that thing about like, and I had to sleep off the next day, yeah. there was a point in my life where I was like, I have to make a choice. And and Leah, little Leah Wood, who said that to me that day, part of me was like, what I, when I really think about what happened for me that day was like, this is incredible fun. I am meeting every rock star. I am... I'm going to concerts with the most extraordinary performers every night at the time. Keith Richards and Patty Hansen were living at the Plaza Hotel because they were having a loft, like, renovated. (laughs) So that's where they lived. And every night, either David Bowie or Tina Turner or Peter Tosh, like, whether you liked reggae, Iggy Pop. Like, it was this who's who of musician icons coming in. And they all obviously talk about being at the top of their game. And what I thought was so incredible, Bob Dylan, they you were hung pre- out with all, these people? all of these people all the time. Why didn't you have a podcast then, Exactly, Alana? exactly. They were never not practicing. Like, like they were already where they were, and then they would get together in Keith's hotel suite and just play all the time. And I remember thinking, like, this was way before I understood the concept of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hours right. or had even heard of it. There was something about being around these people who already had arrived at whatever they were going to be, right? Like, in a way that most people will never um, have that kind of fame. All of them so talented. All of them still so devoted to their craft. And there was something about that little girl in her sweet either snarky or sweet common, who knows, she was three, um, that made me think, like, I need to focus on what it is I want to do. I can be around these incredible, generous people and travel with them and live their life, or I can figure out, not I'm going to be famous, but I'm going to be good. Yeah. And, and these were really kind of seminal experiences early on in my life, like being around the most extraordinarily talented Loopy. I mean, a lot went on that I, as a young, sheltered girl from Teaneck, New Jersey, was like, oh, my God. I want to ask you so many questions just about the Rolling Stones, but I feel like that, that that's there's another... so many more interesting things about you yeah. that I actually care But we will go about. to lunch, and but I'll mostly, tell you all of them. Mostly I want to know, are you still in touch with Keith Richards, and will he be a guest on Little Known Facts at some point? Because that is an interview that I would like... I mean, you'd like to hear it. I would like to very much hear it. I would like to give that to you. (laughs) Let me get to that. Um, Yeah, well, um, yeah, put me on the list. But by the way, funniest, like, by the way, he's Keith Richards, right? Yeah. You have no idea how funny he is. Like, little known fact, Keith Richards is one of the funniest human beings on the planet. Hilarious. Hilarious. I am so, you know, you talked about being proud earlier. I feel very proud of young Alana for being like, yeah, I could I could attach myself to this great thing and that sure would be awesome or I could go become a great thing of my own. Yeah. It feels sort of like that like if you give a man a fish, he can eat for a day, but if you teach him how to fish and somehow somebody that sitting there offering you a fish and you were like, I'm going to go learn to fish. Yeah, and they did and they were so proud of me. Mm-hmm. I mean, they thought it was adorable. <laughs> but they really were. They were really supportive. And anyway, so that's like okay. a whole, so, I don't even know why so we're talking about did, that. But I, yeah. wanna, I, I, um, I mentioned you were a founding member of Naked Angels. And weirdly, and again in this sort of like spiritual kind of context. The and the me- symmetry between us. Yeah. The yeah. members of the Naked Angels Theater Company have found me and I have found them and been drawn to them without necessarily even knowing they were related to Naked mm-hmm. Angels, whether it was like someone I happened to sit next to at a concert who I ended up just really vibing with or like a new friend of mine who I met because she was a winner of a Twitter contest that I did, who it turns out did a bunch of stuff with with Naked Angels, our our mutual friend Joy, who has just become such yeah, a... Yeah, she's a, pretty- Love so in my much life. for us, yeah. You know, um, or like Pippin Parker, who I met because he was like working in academia and theater yeah. and stuff. But he was a founding member too. Yeah. And 
And I love the fact that it has the word angels in it. I know this, was it a Kerouac reference? Uh, I think it was Bukowski, Charles okay. Bukowski, yeah. uh, a, a beautiful writer named Nicole Burdett, who was one of the early members of our troupe, uh, as, as a name was being, you know, everyone was spitballing what mm-hmm. to call it and she found this poem in a Charles Bukowski called Naked Angels and I just feel like the I'll send you I just found the book uh, oh, at, a, yeah? at like uh, an old bookshop the original and I'll, I'll send you a picture of it just yeah, to cool. see the, the source material the way that these people continue to pop up in my life does feel sort of like an angel kind of thing um, and I want to know how this troupe decided to band together in an official way because Naked Angels is still going strong. Yeah. So it's funny. I was just talking to someone. uh, This is what happens when you do 150 (laughs) episodes. It's like, who was it? Um, Part of why Naked Angels, so Naked Angels for the most part, I came in sort of through the side door. A lot of people had gone to NYU together. And at that time, there were two kind of groups that formed David Mamet's Atlantic Theater Company and Naked Angels kind of were happening at the same time, uh, founded by people who all went to NYU together. I came in because um, Michael Greif, who's gone on to do incredible things as a director, my first summer stock job was at the Berkshire Theater Festival in their non-union company called the the Unicorn Company. And Michael was a director in the Unicorn Company. He and I did a play called Cloud Nine together. Um, And then he told me, hey, I'm doing a play with this theater company that's brand new called Naked Angels, um, called Machinal. Christine Nielsen was supposed to be in it, uh, who's now in Gary and friggin' unbelievable. Um, She can't do it. Do you want to do it? So that was how I ended up early on. They had just sort of formed, and I came in through Michael. Michael had gone to Northwestern with Jody Markell, who was a member of Naked Angels. Um, and so as it was all kind of forming, one of the early productions that they did was Machinal. And that's how I came in. Um, and at the time, uh, Robbie Bates, Joe Mantello, Warren Light, Sarah Jessica Parker, Matthew Broderick, Pippin Parker, her brother uh-huh. who, who you met, who now runs the new school drama program, um, uh, Marissa Tomei, Nancy Travis, Mary Stewart Masterson, Tim Ransom, um, on and on and on. This, this, uh, Kenny Lonergan. Uh, <laughs> Kenny. Kenny, yeah. <laughs> the Oscar winning yep. director. Yeah. Kenny um, Lonergan. Exactly. All these people, he was Kenny, and that yeah. was Matthew. I think people still yeah. call him that. Exactly. And all of us um, just wanted to do plays and then we had the extraordinary luck because everything has to have the lucky piece which is one of the company members a guy named Jack Merrill his uncle had a space on 17th Street which is now a housing works but that was our home for years and years and years I go to that housing works at least once a week well I cannot, you really are an honorary angel I, on 17th Street yes I cannot believe that that was your space yep so that was and then someone else had gone to Brown one of our artistic direct artistic directors she went to Brown with John Kennedy jr he became a board member Jackie Kennedy used to come see plays in our theater I mean it really was for me an introduction to, I mean, granted, like I learned the Stones world, but this was, you know, Fisher Stevens was was dating Michelle Pfeiffer. Like it was so, on any given night, anyone from Mike Nichols to, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer would be in the audience. And Michelle Pfeiffer was there painting sets and doing everything she could to help us. Um, It was such a, I've got a bar and let's put on a show mentality. And and we started doing these issues projects where, aside from doing plays, we would have our writers do one acts about social justice issues, environment, politics, things we really cared about. And our issues projects became sort of a, a real staple 
of our season. And those ended up, then we went out to LA. And then Tuesdays at 9, which is a program that still exists, if you're writing something and, and you want to hear it out loud, it's a place for new writers to come and, and workshop their material. There's a, there's a in-school program working with inner city kids to make theater. So we've been able, even though we don't have that space anymore, to make it a very vital part of the theater community and give back. Uh, because we got so much from this community. Is that how you got interested in producing? Absolutely. So part of being in this company was you could bring ideas for shows you wanted to be in, or if you weren't in the show, you would do all the other jobs, from cleaning the bathroom to producing to painting the signs to selling tickets. So all of us, it was, I think of it, I didn't go, I got a, a BFA in acting, but I didn't get an MFA, and I feel like, Naked Angels was my theater school. Mm -hmm. That really was the place where I learned to do every single part of what it is to make a play. The, the acting just being one small part of it. And so you wore every hat because that's what you had to do as part of this community. Um, so I did and I, I produced a play called Tape that my husband was in and, and I think I told you we ended up doing it in New York and then it moved to LA and London like it it was our first international production and um, I think for me the thing about producing that turned out to be something I loved so much is that it is just an opportunity to say you're really talented what tools do you need to be great how can I help you be great how can I help you do what you love have all the materials you need and and fly that makes me want to be a producer because so much of what I hear about producing is like, you got to ask a lot of people for money. Yeah. And that makes me wither. Sick to your stuff. Like, <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, it just like, it deflates me, I yeah. think. Whereas the idea of being like, I'm obsessed with you. Yeah. I want to help you grow into a superstar version of yourself. Um, like, what fuel can I give you to make that happen? That. Like, that speaks to me. That that lifts me up. Yeah. It's very scary dealing with other people's money. I'm not good at that. Tape was the first time when it became a commercial production. And I would go talk to Daryl Roth and different people who had, you know, she cast me in the first play I ever did in New York. And she became a mother figure very early on for me. A mentor, really, more than anything. And, you know, she was really instrumental in explaining to me that if you tell the truth which is I can't promise you you'll get your money back but I I can promise you that you will be a part of something really special and potentially something that could change someone's life that I can give you and I really you know one of my first shows that I did was a HBO series called Tanner 88 and and Robert Altman kind of created the beginning of this idea of like reality and and fiction blended together and I met it was about a political candidate and I met all the real Washington politicians at the time and I really saw how people raised money for politicians mm -hmm. which is you're you're not giving money just to this person you're giving money to an ideal mm -hmm. right they may win or they may not win but you're being a part of something that is a positive message in the world and that's how on the rare occasion now where I do have to raise money I just say like you have an opportunity to be a part of something that's really special if you can't part with this money, if it's going to change your ability to eat, feed your family, do the things that you need to do, don't do it. Right. You're probably going to lose every penny I ask for, so don't do it. And when you frame it as like you're not going to make a single penny back, but you're going to feel great about yourself, mm -hmm. it, it feels better. Totally. You know what it reminds me of is like I uh, occasionally I will go on like a work trip to Atlantic City or even Las Vegas, and there are people who are like, I'm going to go make money by gambling and I'm like I treat those little like quarter slot machines like like when I'm playing pinball exactly I don't put the quarters in the machines expecting to get anything back right. I do it because it's fun and yeah. I'm paying for the entertainment value but when you win isn't it amazing yeah it's and like I, feel the best. Like, I feel like that's how you have to think about putting money or asking for money in the theater yeah. unless you have like I don't know is there such a thing as a guaranteed hit maybe like if you can get in on the next Lin-Manuel Miranda project maybe but nobody can I just got my first DM from him. And I have to say, like, there's something about when he 
sees you, mm -hmm. it's very exciting. I know. I mean, I know you know because you really know him. But it was like, I thought, wow, I'm, uh, this is very exciting to me. I, it, it's rare that someone, um, I don't know, that's not the kind of stuff I usually get excited about at this point. I'm all about, like, we're all just people and we're all the same and that's what my whole podcast is about. Yeah. The only difference between you and Kelly O'Hara is that, she, well, there's a lot of differences. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> she has the song, The Voice of an Angel. But she found, you know, it's all about like doing your work, being great, and then the luck of something breaking through, mm -hmm. right? A project just has to break through. Something you're in has to kind of reach more people. And that's the thing that we have no control over. The show that breaks through, the, the, the movie that breaks through into popular culture. Yeah, or in the some intersection way. of the project you happen to be passionate about and where the cultural milieu is. Yeah, and, yeah. that's the stuff we have no, you know, no control over. Um, but, but anyway, I don't know why I'm sharing that except that I, I admire him so much and it's so silly that, that it meant so much to me, but it, it did because he's, uh, he is someone who is all the things. He is the talent, he is the passion, he is the hard worker, and he is all things generous. Guess what, Alana? You just described yourself. Oh. You, you have really blazed trails. You, have, you, know, you, you are not shy about being a thrilled, starry-eyed, devoted fan of the work and of the people. You also are... Um, you created something, this podcast that you created, um, did something in a long form, really frank way that wasn't about just, um, just celebrating people, but digging in. Um, and you, and you also have this inc incredibly like storied career of your own as an actor, as a producer, um, and as an advocate that, I mean, when you get in touch with somebody, when I got that first DM from you that said, I think we should meet and maybe you'll come be a guest on my podcast, I was like, oh my gosh, like I feel so seen. And that's your gift is making people feel seen for who they really are. And I'm not just saying this, your episode has really resonated. You know, you know, being in radio, it is really mind blowing. We're sitting in a little room in Manhattan and we're not thinking like someone in Dubai is going to hear this, but the the bandwidth and the wingspan of these episodes is large and global. And that has been one of the most touching things for me to see that people who live in countries where it's actually illegal to listen to things that's not, that are not religious. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are really people at risk for listening to cast recordings and for finding artistic material that inspires them. And your episode in particular has resonated for so many people because you have figured out how to take your passion for something and marry it to a career which, like mine, as you described, has, has, has so many arms to it, right? Like there are so many ways in which your passion and joy and support for all things good uh, <laughs> resonates and permeates in so many ways. And I cannot tell you... I mean, obviously, you didn't need me to, to be a megaphone for your message or for you. You have so it. many um, followers and, and passionate fans. But it really is remarkable how many people have heard your story and said to me, like, and, and people who are not in theater. I mean, that's what's so great. They listen to it not because they want to be actors. They just want to be inspired and figure out how to take their passion and turn it into a lifelong career. And you have been the inspiration for so many people. It's a really, I'm so <laughs> proud of that episode. So proud of you, but really proud of that episode. Thank you. You're you, welcome. You, like I said, you, you were the first, one of the first people who said like, yeah, okay, it's cool. Like you've got this, you created an alter ego and it got popular and stuff. And, and I always cringe a little bit when people say like, you got it all figured out because I feel like all I did was try to entertain myself in my downtime. <laughs> exactly. And I d happened to do it on a platform where other people could find it and listen in. But it's not like I had some big major plan right. in life to like, I just tried to, I mean, ugh, I feel like it sounds so. Be corny. Go ahead. Just like follow your joy, mm -hmm. you know, but like, 
it didn't ever feel like work to me. So it was never like, you know, at least at the beginning, I just kind of like, I would have a thought about theater and I would barf it it out onto the internet. But that's going back to this idea of like, you just don't know, you know, I'm getting my hair cut. Mm -hmm. You happen to be one of the first adapters of Twitter, Mm -hmm. of understanding how to use it in a way not to self-promote, but promote things that you love. Right. And then you found other people who loved the same thing. You know, Michael Ian Black was on my show. He's another person. He was an early um, personality Mm -hmm. who found that he could have really important conversations with strangers. Um, And it's really interesting to me. Like, you know, I joke about it, but until I think it was Jillian Pensavale explained to me, like, there can't be a space between the at sign and the, and the handle. Or it won't, re- like, literally, I did not understand. It can't be, what is it, the aspirin? Uh, yeah, yeah, ampersand. Ampersand? No, that's the and No, sign. that's the and sign. The at. The at yeah. sign, space, Broadway girl, you NYC. You from, a, like, a functional standpoint? No, literally, like, you- <laughs> you're not connecting. Broadway girl will not see it if you don't have the at right next to the that's B. Hilarious. So I'm saying, like, talk about someone who, unlike you, had, had zero intuition about how to use any of this technology and to be in a field now of podcasting, which is besides the conversation, which is what I love to have more than anything, all the tech stuff, mm-hmm. it confounds me. It's really hard. And it, and it, and it, I cry all the time no. trying to figure out. <laughs> I do. But I do feel like how amazing that you understood intuitively that this was a place to we talk about this a lot. I, I live for community. That's all I want. And it's so funny that Twitter has become a community. It and, can be. It yeah. can be. And, and I fight so hard to just push kindness and collaboration and the idea of, like we talked about at the beginning, of not not getting competitive with people who have a lot in common with right. you because you're going to be your each other's greatest resource. Yeah. And I believe very strongly that joy is a muscle, that um, support is a muscle, that the, the, you know, the more positivity you put out into the world, especially on social media, the more you're going to get it back. And, um, and you know, I do a lot of crying too. But I, I want to come back to the fact that that I think what is so compelling about that episode we did together is that you really wanted to know me. You weren't just like, okay, what's advice for people who want to have 35,000 Twitter right. followers? You were like, you know, what's the like dark underbelly of that? How did you, you know, oh, you mean Broadway wasn't always your obsession? Your obsession was just like getting obsessed with stuff? Yeah. That, you know, and you helped me sort of figure out myself through asking the right questions and and inviting the real whole flawed bizarre but that was my whole desire like julie m moore came on my show julie has done 50 million interviews Mm -hmm. right so like what could i possibly ask julie m moore and i found that because we talk about the work so little Mm -hmm. and we just talk about you use the 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 phrase origin Mm -hmm. story, you know, everybody has one. I mean, everything about Julianne Moore is based on the fact that her father was in the military and she just traveled from base to base and had to start anew every year of her life. So that's why Julianne Moore became an actress because wherever she went, there was a drama department that she could you know, drop into, even if she didn't know anyone, even if she didn't speak the language. So she could be in Germany or she could be in New Jersey. And that was a room where she would be accepted. And and time after time in every episode, there's a reason that people have found the arts because it saved them. Yeah. And well, it's it's your your interview series, Little Known Facts with Alana Levine is I mean, you really do get the best of the best and we get to hear about their accolades, but we also get to hear them talk about like what their kids did yesterday or like what just the the I wanna use the word mundane in the most positive sense uh possible. Like 
we get to know more about them as superstars, but mostly we get to know them as humans who are not that different from us. The most incredible thing is I just had Tommy Kale on, and we got 28 minutes in, and I was like, Tommy, we haven't even mentioned Hamilton. I know. And we are 28 minutes in. The fact that he shared with me his hair care regime, <laughs> like, that has gone viral. Like, that's hilarious to me. These are the little known facts that curly-haired people want to know what yep. curly-haired people have found. And we're not going to say it here because we want you to go, or this is going to be a, like a blatant plug <laughs> oh, a to go teaser. listen to the Tommy Kale yes. episode of Little yes. Known Facts. And I'm so glad you mentioned Tommy because I wrap up every episode of Laura Haywood Interviews talking about an important cause. We yes. say we're doing one last segment, Just Cause, yes. um, which is a play on words. Because I love of course that you do we don't, this. We don't need a reason to talk about the good we're doing in the, in the world. We do it Just Cause. And, of course, we're talking about an important cause. And um, Tommy was just honored by the Stuttering Association for the Young, which is also known as SAY, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that uses summer camp and speech therapy and creative expression to empower, educate, and support young people who stutter and the world that surrounds them. Tell me about SAY and why it's important to you. So I'm so happy that you asked. The thing that is extraordinary about this organization is that it creates a safe haven for kids who stutter. And what started out as like one after school class a week has become a national organization. It's actually becoming international. The thing about kids who stutter is they just need a place where people will give them all the time in the world that they need to say what they need to say. And most of these kids spend their days in the back of the classroom, not raising their hand, fearing that they will be bullied or ridiculed because it just takes them longer to say what they need to say. And we are in a world that is lacking in compassion for these kids. And Taro Alexander, an old friend of mine, started this organization, which basically creates theater classes, um, provides speech therapy, and mostly a summer camp for these kids where they can spend the summer with kids like them who stutter and feel normal. And it is so beautiful to see how they thrive and how relaxed they feel in the company of people who are dealing with the same issues. The staff, uh, so many of the staff members are adults who also stutter and Basically, it is um, creating a home, a safe place, and uh, one of the most remarkable organizations for kids who stutter. Well, I want everyone to go to say.org, S-A-Y.org. I'm going to make a donation in your honor today, Alana. Everyone listen to Little Known Facts with Alana Levine. You can find it on Apple Podcasts and all the other podcasts. Um, you're the best. You're the best. Thank you for having me.